introverted and stuck in a social setting that you can't get out from. Sounds bad? Well, it is. You're about to witness the most intense horror film of the century as we follow an introverted insomniac named Ian on a solo adventure that turns out not to be solo at all. Poor Ian. From social interactions, trigger panic attacks, to nervous breakdown hallucinations, all the way to being chased by an Australian mass murderer, or so, this movie covers all nine circles of hell. If you're an introvert, at least. Let's go. <laughs> We start out with a man named Ian arriving at a remote national park somewhere in New Zealand. Looking at his phone with 15 missed calls, we can either guess that he fought with his wife today and felt like he's in need of an adventure to once again prove to himself that he is a free man, or he escaped a psychiatric ward. Before getting out of his car, he is approached by a strange woman apparently just coming back from a hunting trip. Besides asking at least twice whether he's on his own, she also mentions how he should be careful on his hike because the hunting traps were laid out close to the hiking trail. This is either a red flag or a red herring. What happens next though certainly makes the whole situation more tricky to figure out. Once the woman left, we see Ian staring into the distance, trying to make something out. It's as if he sees something that I can't quite spot. This will clearly play a crucial role and sets the mood for his seemingly mad tendencies. Anyway, we cut to seeing Ian walking towards the entrance of the track he picked. It's a loop track which normally is a track that loops and carries you right back to where you started. Looking at his massive backpack though, it looks like his trip will last for multiple days. However, observing his jeans and more than a bad pick of upper body wear, we can be certain that this guy has never seen the inside of a forest, let alone went on a hike that included any overnight rests. As much is confirmed when he arrives at the first direction sign indicating that the car park, the place where he started at, is only a 10 minutes walk away. He is so out of breath already though that he looks more like your average office employee taking the staircase for the first time in 10 years after the elevator broke down. Meaning 10 minutes past, 9 hours more to go, as we now realize his first target is to get to the Kiwi Hut. After contemplating whether he should apologize to his wife or embark on this risky 9 plus hour adventure that he doesn't seem to be prepared for at all, he picks the easier choice and is now only 8 hours and 59 minutes away from his first goal. But things don't go as planned. After a while of hiking, taking rests in between and clearly being in a lot of psychological pain, he comes across a couple on the same loop track as he is. But instead of passing them, he decides to wait until they continue walking in order to avoid speaking to them. This means Ian is either a painfully awkward introvert or simply in so much mental turmoil that he can't possibly see himself socializing with anyone. This would also make sense considering he embarked on this journey alone, indicating that he's looking for some silent personal time to deal with whatever he had been facing before departure. Whether this indeed was a fight with his wife or not, we'll find out. But in the meantime, Ian waits until he eventually realizes they won't move anytime soon and instead opts for taking an off-road path to pass them himself. Considering that the hunter lady at the beginning told him he should stick with the track because of potentially deadly traps laid out nearby, this is clearly a stupid idea. However, it also shows to what length he's willing to go in order to avoid any sort of social interactions. Just too bad for him that this couple are not the only ones he'll be meeting. After he successfully passes them, they continue their journey as well and almost catch up. So he once again decides to leave the track and hides behind a nearby bush. Being almost caught though, his idea nevertheless works out. After the couple walks ahead, Ian is surprised by yet another hiker. But not just any other hiker, but the most extroverted dude you can imagine, which, for obvious reasons, is probably the worst interaction Ian could have foreseen. After the most awkward confrontation making me cringe so hard I had to take a break, the two actually end up walking together despite Ian's unwillingness to do so. In fact, there are three instances where Ian tries, in the most inefficient ways, to tell this guy to leave him alone. Where are my introverts at? Leave a comment from the comfortably isolated place you're currently seeking social refuge in. Anyway, after failing to tell this dude to F off, they both arrive at the Kiwi Hut just before sunset. It's the first cabin on this multiple day hike and reason to cheer up and feel a sense of accomplishment. Not for Ian though. Not only does he wish he would have never embarked on this journey, he also finds the couple inside he so desperately avoided before. The cringe doesn't stop here however. Ian is hungry and decides to cook, just too bad the guy he walked with, whose name by the way is Nikki, also wants to cook. You see, for all those clueless extroverts watching right now, there's nothing worse for an introvert than being watched. Ian, even though probably starving after this insane first day hike, can't bear Nikki staring at him while he's preparing his meal. 
and fair enough. Despite Ian suffering from an extreme case of pathological social anxiety, Nikki here is socially retarded. Imagine being the reason for someone breaking into a cold sweat and pretending you don't get it. I mean, no wonder kids these days would call this a violent, criminal offense. In fact, so far, this horror film is shot in a way that makes the viewer uncomfortable merely by framing a person, meaning Ian being uncomfortable himself. It's a very interesting way to trigger emotions. There's that autism test where prospects are shown photographs of people showing exaggerated emotional expressions such as these. Somebody not on the spectrum will feel an emotional response due to mirror neurons being activated, which are thought to be in part responsible for empathy and is therefore more often than not able to accurately define the emotions present. So if you're watching this film and Ian's discomfort does not make you uncomfortable, I have bad news for you. Or good news, depending on your level of Munchausen. Anyway, Ian's already overworked brain is on the verge of exploding. Fight or flight are the only options left. And considering his low self-esteem, it's clear that fighting, which in this case would be telling Nikki to get the F out, is not an option for Ian. He therefore pretends that he is done cooking, screws up even more, is even more embarrassed, uses the distraction caused by the tiny kitchen fire to his advantage, and decides to escape the lodge. Now here is where things get even more interesting. We have seen how much psychological pain Ian seems to be in, we've also seen that he seems to be paranoid often looking back trying to see if someone's following him. Being outside now, in the middle of the night, it's clearly even worse. As much is proven the moment Ian once again thinks he's seeing a shadowy figure standing somewhere in the distance staring right back at him. The question is, is it someone or is he just off the charts mentally? I'll leave you guys to guess in the comments. However, for Ian, this is enough to return back to the lodge and bear the pain of social interaction instead. The next interesting jigsaw piece that we get is the fact that Ian is not able to sleep a single minute. A few scenes further down the road, it's actually mentioned that he suffers from insomnia, which is a dead giveaway that nothing he experiences can be relied on, and he really shouldn't be out here on his own. Instead, he should have booked a countryside wellness resort, organized a set of different benzodiazepines to shut down his clearly overprocessing brain, and downloaded Freedom Dot to app that isn't the sponsor of this video, but nevertheless a pretty cool app I've just discovered to block applications for a definitive time period, helping me fight my obsession to see people die on Twitter. The next day, he continues his journey with all three others and actually seems to be open up a bit. Good for him. He gets to enjoy taking selfies, has a lovely break, and gets to pee and finds fresh blood traces on a nearby tree. Great, just when things started to light up. Rejoining the others, he tells them of what he saw, but they just brush it off as nothing important. And fair enough. Fresh blood markings inside a wild forest is at best a sign of animal struggle. We now fast forward to the second overnight stay in yet another hut on their trek. Things finally start to fall in place. After arriving and settling in, they find two other backpacks lying around, proving that someone else must have been here and is likely bound to come back. However, by nightfall, the missing people have still not returned. Ian, and so would I, frankly, takes this as a massive red flag and is worried sick that something or someone must have happened to those two missing people. Suffering from insomnia again, he is surprised by Nikki, who offers him some company. The two talk clearly build some rapport and Nikki eventually offers Ian some sleeping pills to help him with his chronic despair. It's also revealed that Ian had his own company with emphasis on had. More is not revealed though. More interestingly, however, the moment Nikki disappears to sleep, Ian goes through the backpacks of the missing hikers. He finds a camera, goes through the photos and spots Nikki in the back of one of them. And there goes the rapport from before. Clearly, this sends Ian further down the mental black abyss in which he's trapped in. Just too bad he knocked back an ambient before. Let's just hope he won't be surprised by a walrus tonight. He wakes up seemingly well rested and even remembers the scary finding of last night. He immediately rushes over to the backpack, pulls out the camera, but finds that the battery is empty. The following scene is crucial and sets the turning point of the whole film. As he tries telling Monica about the photo in which Nikki can be seen, Nikki and Monica's boyfriend return back from their early morning stroll. The conversation escalates rapidly, resulting in Ian accusing Nikki of having killed them, which in all honesty, is a stretch considering it's only a photo. However, there are things that must be said here. First, where are the girls? Why would they stay outside overnight? 
Even if they went camping outside, why leave your gear back? It's easy to see why Ian is so worked up. Not that it's a good strategy to accuse people of anything without solid proof, especially when those people could be dangerous. It would have been better to shut up the moment you found the camera's empty battery, until you could have regained access to the photo in question, making any accusatory comments only makes you look like the one who got problems, which is the worst case scenario when you try to solicit support. Ian doesn't stop there, however. He also continues saying Nikki drugged him, which of course is a lie, and only further weakens his point and makes him lose credibility. As we know, he graciously accepted the Ambien and actually got a full night of sleep in return. It is true that it's strange to find Nikki in the photos of the girls. As much is said by Monica, who does, for some reason, takes Ian's side and inquires further. Ian mentions how Nikki was in front of him, but when he met him, he was coming from behind. This was just after Ian went off path to avoid the couple at the beginning of the film, if you remember. Nikki answers that he went back to the car park, which leads to more inconsistencies as this would mean he would have needed to meet Ian on the way back, which he didn't. It's also becoming clear that Nikki seems to have problems coming up with a straight answer. He stutters and avoids eye contact the moment the other three start to poke holes into his story. Just too bad that the following happens. Alright, now that the two girls have returned, things should clear up, right? Apparently they were gone because they decided to sleep in a cave 10 kilometers away. Apparently without their gear. As if that was a completely normal thing to do. Anyway, as they go on with their story, they notice their camera lying in the open. After asking why, our characters begin to embarrassingly tell them that they were worried about them and thus check the camera for clues. The girls make this exceedingly awkward, which I don't get why. They were literally gone overnight in the middle of a wild forest. It was a very sensible thing for Ian or anyone for that matter to check on their gear for any clues where they might be. It's not that he jumped on it the moment he got to the lodge. He waited until well after nightfall before he checked the belongings. If something happened to them, an accident or whatever, every hour would have mattered. That they get so worked up over this is pretty stupid. Of course, if they got something to hide, it's a whole different story. Something which, at least in Ian's eyes, is a valid possibility. He removes himself from the group for two reasons. One, he doesn't believe them at all, and two, he just embarrassed himself and now rather stays on his own. But Ian, despite his issues, is not a bad guy. You see, not very far away he decides to return, asks Nikki for a moment, and apologizes directly. It takes courage to do this, so hats off to Ian here. He also decides to apologize to Monica and Austin here. Well done. The next day, after the happy fun bunch continues with their trek, they soon split up. Always a bad sign when that happens. The couple decides they want to go to the nearby waterfall instead of the next lodge. Ian and Nikki agree and continue solo again, intending to meet them again the next evening. The two chicks from before are now also gone again. So as Ian and Nikki continue, they soon come across a massive bear trap almost pinning them in place. This clearly means they are off path, which Ian points out eventually. Nikki, on the other hand, ignores that valid claim and orders them to simply continue with their journey. This is clearly a red flag, perhaps even two. Firstly, continuing off track in the middle of who knows where is a death sentence and not advised, with or without GPS beacon, which I doubt they have anyway. Secondly, Ian was told by the hunter lady at the very start of the film that there are traps just about everywhere nearby. As long as he stays on track, there's nothing to worry about, she added. Well, guess what? You're off track now, Ian, and should probably tell your companion as much. The manner in which he will reply will be indication enough whether he is trying to lure you somewhere to ruthlessly murder you or is just as helplessly lost as you. But simply continuing with this quasi-stranger without raising all of these points is insane, even with the anxiety disorder of Ian. I would refuse continuing with Nikki, prepare myself for a fight-or-flight situation, and most certainly track my way back until I get back on path. Our two characters don't do that, though. Ian is persuaded by Nikki to continue, and while the latter is taking a leak, the following happens. Yep. Looks like the shadows have yet to stop haunting our character. Now here, the movie gets interesting. Ian tries to warn Nikki of what he just saw, but before he can get the point across, Nikki interrupts and urges Ian to listen. He does, and it soon becomes clear that they are in proximity of the waterfall the couple was leaving for earlier that day. They cheer as they follow the noise and find themselves back on path. 
but nightfall has already arrived as well. And being in the middle of a wild forest, in the middle of the night, is definitely not a good idea. The two continue until they arrive at this menacing entry point for the last stint until the next hut. Ian has a terrible feeling, an intuition that something will go terribly wrong and suggests turning around. Normally, I would advocate to follow your gut instincts. But Ian, barely getting any sleep and clearly dealing with some mental breakdown situation, is not the most reliable candidate when it comes to intuition. Not to mention all the wrong hunches he had been having so far on this trip. Nevertheless, Nikki is hard-pressed to get Ian back on track but eventually can convince him. The two follow the path using the $300 torch of Nikki when Ian stumbles and drops the light down a slope. Awesome. And because it's a $300 light, Nikki immediately forces his mate down there to retrieve it right now. And fair enough, it was Ian's fault, but you could also be less of an asshole and actually help your friend getting down there. The worst thing would be an accident that renders one of you incapable of walking, and looking at this slope, it's not unlikely that something like this happens. In any case, the moment Ian gets down there, he once again has visions of dark figures, and thus rushes back up to find Nikki absolutely nowhere. On the other hand, Austin and Monica are. That's strange. Shouldn't they be in their hut further up the path? Another red flag or just coincidence? Well, in Ian's eyes, it's a glaring red flag. Having seen a shadowy figure down the slope and not being able to see Nikki at this point, he accuses Austin of having murdered him. That's mildly inappropriate and definitely a tad racist and it definitely doesn't help the situation either. Antagonizing people that have helped you previously is almost always a bad strategy unless you have proof for your accusations. But Ian doesn't, and Nikki's appearance mere seconds later proves just as much. Anyhow, the quartet is once again reunited and seeks refuge inside the next hut. There, while Ian rests, the three decide that it's best for Ian to go home the next day as quickly as possible. Nikki decides he would be taking him back to the car park since he's used to walking with Ian for a few days now. Now that's all sweet and stuff, but you probably shouldn't loudly whisper about a paranoid guy laying in the room next door. But maybe I'm the paranoid guy here. In any case, once the next dawn breaks, the four split up and Ian and Nikki indeed find themselves back on path towards the car park where all of this had started. But will they make it there alive? Not quite. Once Nikki goes for the inevitable leak, he does not return. Ian, at this point as agitated as ever, knows exactly what happened to his friend. The shadowy figures must have caught him, so he does what every other sensible person would do. He looks for the others, screams that they killed Nikki, and expects them to help. Now what would you do if you were in the shoes of this couple? Not gonna lie, but I would probably do the exact same thing. Namely, avoid Ian at all costs and stay away from him for good. He was going psychotic after all. At least there were many indications of that. And now he claims Nikki was murdered by them. It would be plausible to assume that Ian had murdered him and that he's now trying to lure us into yet another trap. Needless to say, being cautious here is of utmost importance. The two disappear for an emergency talk, which quickly turns into a real emergency. Yep, there's no way Ian could be the culprit for that. Especially considering Austin here literally chases after Monica, who had been pulled into the forest mere seconds ago and can't find her even though he's running after her for at least 20 seconds. There's no way any human being could pull a full-grown adult through obstructed forest ground without being seen and that quick on top. Sure, it is suspicious that he finds Ian just where he expects his wife to be, but still, the circumstances are clearly defined here and should point at an alibi for Ian. Nevertheless, a predicted fight breaks out. Austin steps into a bear trap, and both of them finally get to witness what actually had been preying on them for days. A freaking bird, that's right. A giant black bird that looks like a creature straight from a New Zealandish Jurassic Park, because why not? The two, now finally convinced that they can trust each other, escape to the nearest hut and plan to stay there for the night. But having giant blackbirds prey on you, being lost in this forest is probably not the best starting point. Not to mention Austin's leg injury. One thing is clear though, these birds have long necks. This is certainly their strength but also their weakness. Ian does a good job once he enters the hut. He actively looks for tools to fight with and quickly finds an axe. Jackpot. Now with Austin being injured anyway, it would make sense to have him play bait while Ian lurks in the shadows waiting to swing the axe at the bird's weak spot, the neck. But they don't do that. 
In fact, after the first noise is heard, Ian ventures over to the entrance door as if he was expecting a friend for dinner. The giant bird immediately breaks in, causing Ian to drop his weapon. He is almost killed but can grapple with the bird pretty efficiently, clearly showing he had been an avid UFC fan before embarking on this hike. It would be a scary scene if it wasn't so hilarious. In fact, it's a miracle to me how he's able to literally strangle this massive thing with his bare hands. Hopefully our main character gains some confidence after this pretty cool fight, if of course he makes it out alive. Okay, way to go. Even though he did a great job, he's thrown to the floor when the bird takes aim at Austin, piercing him in the process. One character less. Ian is able to strike back though and wins the battle as the last man standing. I guess only the paranoid survive. Now we get a quick montage of Ian sneaking back through the woods, all the way back to the car park, avoids a few other giant black birds, and can indeed escape successfully. What a film. Hilarious to some extent, but definitely well shot considering the low budget for it. How would you react if you found a paranoid, borderline crazy stranger in the wilderness talking about lurking monsters in the shadows? Let me know in the comments. And with that said, thanks for watching as always my friends, take care and binge another one.